I have been whispering all morning. I have half a voice, and so I'm going to do my best. Um, I want to start with a couple of announcements. So we had lots of things planned for January, uh, none of which are, are playing out the way we thought. And so, um, Alex, I just turned those off. Can you turn those off, please? Thanks. Um, so we're going to squeeze in some kind of vision announcements, things like that right now, um, and, and give you an opportunity to kind of know what's coming. Uh, the elders and our staff will keep you in the loop next things. Like we're going to highlight some of the organizations that we're giving to this year, a church that we're helping plant, um, Young Life, who's going to be across the street reaching Artesia High School, things like, or not Artesia, Serios High School. I don't know why they said that, anyhow. But, um, and so we'll highlight those things, tell you what we are doing collectively as a church. This is your giving, your tithes, your offerings that are going to reach others with the gospel. And so uh, stay tuned. I, I, what I learned this last week is that uh, there's a flaw in our app. It's not pinging when you get an announcement. And so we're getting that fixed. So between the app and the, and the emails, would you just please keep on the lookout? We have a lot of information that will be coming out. Probably the first thing I'll be able to do is type or text, and so maybe we'll get some stuff. But um, I wanted to first do a budget for the year, and so we can put that up. Uh, we are aiming at an income of 535000 That includes, like, the rental for the preschool um, and then tithes and offerings. And let me tell you a little bit about that number. Uh, the, if we isolated just out the giving portion, not our giving, not the number below that, but the tithes and offerings portion of our income, what you would see is it's a little smaller than last year's projected giving, and it's a little bigger than this year's. And I will tell you a high and a low for that. So this last year, 2022, our income, our giving, our tithes and offerings, your, your giving, uh, was lower than we anticipated, and for whatever reason. And, and let me just tell you this, when, you know, we live in California. You've got to win, like, two families a month over to the church just to keep up with the people leaving state, right? And so here's what happens when people leave the church and go find new churches and new locations. We're getting new families in. If you look around, you see new families all around you, and that's great. You may even see growth in our numbers, but what happens when families that have been here a while leave, they take their giving with them, and families that come, they don't give as soon. It just takes a while to onboard, right? And so our giving has been a little lower. However, in 2022, we also fundraised $100,000 to get our parking lot and landscape and all that done. You put those two numbers together, it was a really good year. Take out the fundraising, it was a, it was a rough year. So I know we have it, I know we can, and so here's my ask. Would you pray for the next couple of weeks about what your involvement in giving is this year? And we'll talk about what God calls us to, and we'll talk about it more throughout the year, especially after I get back. But what is your giving commitment this year? Would you prayerfully consider what does God call you to give, and will you get involved with that, all right? The next one down is our giving, so you can see right there, it's $500 off, but you can see that our giving, we give 10% of our income outside the church, right? So we take, just like we ask you and me and, and, and God calls all of us to do, we take our first tenth and we give it away outside the church. We partner with Acts 29, our church planting network, we partner with church plants, we partner with local organizations like Young Life, who uh, this year in 2023 are reaching Cerritos High School. And so we partner with organizations. So our first tenth, just like we call you two, we give away outside the church. The next number is payroll. Payroll in Southern California is always the biggest number. Um, and then obviously ministries and facilities. And let me, let me just tell you why facilities is such a low number. Um, that's because we're in a building that we own outright. And so we are debt-free on this building from the day we moved in. The reason we had to fundraise for the parking lot and the outside is because as we moved in and did our remodel, that's what it cost. And then COVID hit, and then afterwards we finished. We did our final phase, right? 
Then there's some more things. You'll see a stripe out there that needs to be repaired in the parking lot, but we've already met with them. They're going to come in and do it after the rainy season. But we're here debt-free. So we're here with low needs, right, in, in, in a great way to reach our community. And so um, please know that's, uh, that's a part of the puzzle, if you will. All right, I'm going to move on from that. Staffing, I promised you a few messages ago when we were in 1 Timothy that we'd be more, um, that I would communicate more about staffing changes. And over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of staffing changes. Some, two moved out of, the, out of state, uh, some out of the area, like Justine moved to South County, and uh, I know Brooke, you know, in Tennessee. We had two go back to school full-time, Holly and Lily. And so some staff changes are just parts of life, right? Some, we had a couple of worship leaders that just didn't play out well, and that's just a part of life or ministry too. Um, we brought on Yvette for about two years to come in and be a bridge as we walked through a bunch of things. And that time's going to come up in the next probably 90 days. And, and she's not going anywhere. She's remaining a leader. She's coming on. We'll be ordaining her as a deacon with her husband, Casey, next Sunday. Just, yeah, and we're excited. And let me just say this. So Casey and Yvette, Edwin and Ashley Virus, and Nancy Duncan, we're bringing on five brand new deacons. We're excited about that. And so, yeah, you guys can celebrate that. So sometimes staff changes aren't, they don't have to be negative things, right? But in the middle of that, here's what I want you to hear. The reason I bring up some of those changes, we have strategically not hired those pieces, right? We've absorbed them among the staff. Now, we did bring on Pastor Amadi to help us kind of bridge the gap, some of the things that Yvette does, some of the care for staff, things like that. But we've been hanging on and holding on and interviewing several people, working on what I feel is the key thing that we have needed. And when I say I, I'm speaking on behalf of the elders. This has been a group working on this for months. And if you got the update we have been meeting with for a few months, we've been meeting with John and Jennifer Detlison. We'll put a picture up for them. Uh, this is them and their family. That's still our budget. Marsha's asleep back there. There we go. All right. So that's uh, Pastor John in the back. That's Jennifer up front in the middle and his four kids. That picture, I can tell you right now, is old. The, the, the girl on the right-hand side works, well, my, yeah, you're right, uh, works at Hume Lake. She's in her early 20s. The girl on the left is at her sophomore year in Cal Baptist. And then the two boys, one's in high school, one's in middle school. Uh, I've known them for many years uh, pastor John's been a lead pastor of a church. He's been an associate pastor of a church. He is currently the family's pastor at a church in Riverside. And he is leaving that and coming here because he believes in the vision and the things that we're doing. And so we spent months meeting with him, with him and his wife, with him and his family, our elders and their wives and their families. We've all gathered together. We've continued to meet digitally and in person. And we were going to pick up Pastor John in March or April. And then with my surgery, we upped the timeline to February 1st. So Pastor John will be here. Um, if you're in youth, I said this on Wednesday night, it's like a 100-mile commute one way and a 100-mile commute back. I over said that, by the way. Didn't mean to, but I Googled it this, or I uh, mapped it this morning. It's like 60 miles one way, 60 miles the other. So about a 120-mile commute, just the same, for every Sunday, every Monday, every Wednesday. And he is committed to that, his wife is committed to that, his family is committed to that, because they believe in what we're doing. And this year, 2023, we're really casting a family ministry vision. We're going to walk with all ages. When I say families, don't think just young families. That's a big part of the puzzle. But think grandparents and singles, younger and older, you know, families with kids, families are going to have kids, families that have already raised kids, all of that. So a family year in 2023. Every one of you has a place in that. I was just talking to Nicole Jones. I don't know if she's here today, but I was just talking to her about if I'm walking with a family who is raising a middle school student, they're having a hard time discipling or teaching their middle school student child, well, I'm going to have them call her. She's been teaching in the middle school forever and has been doing youth here and, and just participates at that level. Like Everybody has a role. Just because she's single, she doesn't have kids does not mean she doesn't have a role in families. We as a church are a family of families. 
and we share that responsibility together. And I always tell you, if you're a parent, it is your responsibility. God holds you responsible for the discipleship of your kids. And our job is to wrap around you and partner with you as a church. And I've said that for years, and I, and I came to the conclusion, I've even talked to some of you, that I came to the conclusion last year that we hadn't really empowered you or equipped you. Now I'm throwing things. By the way, hot tea and lemon. It's not because if you're in the NFC, the Cowboys are probably killing you. Um, just, just throwing that out there, all right? Unless you're an Eagles fan, I can say that with some level of security. So I know that's going to come up later in my message watch. So we're a family of families, and we believe that we need to walk alongside parents far better. And that I've been calling fathers especially to be disciplers, disciplers of their kids. And yet we've not spent time training dads, training moms how to do that. So that all changes this year. And part of that is hiring Pastor John. Part of that is things I'm going to do, our elders are going to do, uh, just so you know. All right? Um, I want to put a verse on the screen. It's Psalm 78. This verse was uh, a verse that when we started generations seven years ago, by the way, today is January 8th, January 10th, 2016 is when we started generations. So this is our seven year marker. So it's really exciting. And uh, yeah. I'm incredibly grateful. This verse has been a part of it since before we started Generations. Here it is. Give ear, to, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. Now I want to push pause. That our fathers have told us. The writers of the psalm, the writer of this psalm is saying this. He learned about the promises and covenant of God. He learned from their fathers, plural, not just one, his dad, or from the generation that came before him. They passed this on. Here he is. Now he owns, understands, holds the promises of God. His dads gave him that. But we will not hide them from their children, meaning the generation they're in, but tell them to the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord is might, and the wonders that he has done. We will tell our generation and the next generation. He goes on, God has established a testimony which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, meaning them, that the next generation might know them, that children yet unborn and arise and tell their, to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. I want you to see this intergenerational plan for the gospel. Can you back up one slide? Thank you. There we go. All right. He commanded our fathers, generation before us, to teach their children. I always tell you that we are where we are today because of the generation before us. We're in a building debt-free, not because of anything you or I did, but because of the generation before us. You with me? And there's a handful of them here that have paved the way for us to be here so that we can focus on ministry here. So that generation, they've taught us, right? That children yet unborn, meaning our kids and the next generation to the next generation might know the promises of God, right? They might know and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. The plan for the gospel is not some flashy pulpit or TV ministry. It's from father and mother to their children. And as they grow up to their children, as they grow up to their children, and we partner and wrap alongside every one of those families, I cannot achieve here what you can achieve in your living room. And it's not my job. My job is to walk with you as you do it. So that's this year. Everybody, seniors, grandparents, we need you. Singles, young families, we need you. Young families, older families, kids, we need you. And we believe that we're a family of families. And that, that is our focus, that we will be a family together. So will you pray with me and then we'll get into the message. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that we are here. We thank you that you have blessed us with this day. I thank you for a church that loves me and has supported me.
in some pretty rushed and timely news. And so thank you, Lord. I'm incredibly grateful. Will you, Lord, open our eyes to your word this morning? Will you lead us through your scriptures? Will you challenge us to be your people the way you have created us to be? We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Quick thing I promised you I would share during, uh, while I was here. So there's a lot that's going on in my neck. And I was planning on doing something in May, April or May. Um, and that was fine with the surgeon. That was fine with everybody until we got some different things in, some different images in. And they bumped somebody out of a surgery and put me in 12 days later. And so uh, last couple weeks have been spent running frantically around <laughs> trying to get cleared for surgery. And so I was reading through all the things that are going to happen, and it's a lot, if I'm being honest. Um, I'm being surgery for just a little over five hours. Um, it's a lot. And so the easiest thing to tell you is they're going to fuse two levels. And so they're going to take three vertebrae and make them all one with a plate and some screws, six screws and, and, and some other things. And they've got to kind of carve out some space for the nerves that are in there that have been really unhappy with me. And so they're going to try and make them happy again. Um, I'll be spending the night in the hospital, should be coming home the next day, we'll see, obviously. And um, so thank you, I appreciate your prayers. I had to send my New Testament class that meets tomorrow morning at 8, I had to tell them, I'm sorry, I'm not going to meet you on your first day, I'm probably not going to meet you in January. And so, um, plan on being back in the game somewhere in January, end of January, but I'm planning for February. And if that doesn't work, we'll plan out February. But you'll hear from me. You'll know. You'll hear from our staff and our elders. Um, Deuteronomy 5, that's where we're going to be today. If I never get the chance to tell you again, Generations Church, I love you. I love being your pastor. It is a privilege. I know that God could use any person with way better choices than this knucklehead. But for whatever reason, God has seen fit to use me here. And I love that, and I value that, and I just want you to know I love you. So we're going to push Revelation out until I'm back. We're going to push that out a few weeks. I've asked a few of my friends, lead pastors, great preachers. So Daniel Jansen, we call him DJ. He was here just a couple months ago. Uh, people, you guys had responded really well to him. Uh, pastor Mike Larson, we know and love Pastor Mike. Uh, PJ Tobian from Bethany Baptist, he'll be here in about three weeks, and Rudy Rubio from the church that we're supporting in LA, Reformed Church LA, he'll be here four weeks from now, and uh, then we'll see what's going on after that, but all of them are phenomenal, and all of them are great, and they will treat you incredibly well, and they've been overwhelmingly supportive. So I want to put this note on the screen, a family of families. We will intentionally pass on our faith to the next generation of disciples and leaders by being a family of families together so that we fulfill the calling of God on each and every one of us. We will pass on our faith to the next generation of disciples and leaders so that we will fulfill the calling that God has placed on every one of us to take our faith and in whole part, take the gospel and hand it off to the next generation. And really, that's our goal. That should always be our goal. But that is really something we're going to strive for in this, in this coming year and years after. So Deuteronomy 5, if you have a Bible that you're borrowing, there's one under the seat. You'll need it. It is page 150. I can give you the cheat code. Deuteronomy 5. I mean, forgive me again, I've got hot tea here. If my team beat your team, forgive me. I'm just saying. Verse 1. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you should learn them and be careful to do them. There's two key things here. One, Deuteronomy, an odd word indeed, uh, it, deutero means second, and namos is law. It means it's the second giving of the law. The first giving of the law came in Exodus with the Ten Commandments. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments up on Mount Sinai, and he brought them down to the people, found them worshiping an idol, there was a moment in history. 
And then gave them the, well, first he threw some things at them, had to go back up the hill, back down the hill, and then gave them the law. The Ten Commandments stand of this thing that has is, that is stood out and stood the test of time. And it's a summary of God's law for us. I don't know where Alex went, but I was asking to get those churned off. Can we still do that, please, Chris? Um, so Deuteronomy gives the, means the second giving of the law. Now, this is coming right before the people pass through the Jordan into the promised land. And so they're getting ready to inherit God's promises for them. God's promises here, not eternally, right? They're getting ready to inherit something God has given them here. And as they get ready for that, as they prepare for that, Moses, their leader, has been told he can't go with them. He will die in the wilderness, and a new leader will take them into the promised land. But this is the beginning of his last speech to them. His final send-off, his final words, giving them the, here's what God desires for you. And so it's in that moment. I want you to hear it with that kind of weight. I'm not going to go die in the desert, I promise. My hospital's at the beach, so we're good. <laughs> but there is this urgency of, I want you to hear this. Verse 2. The Lord our God has made a covenant with us in Horeb. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us. With all of us here alive today. Verse 4, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain, he said. So he's recalling the time where he came down from Sinai, and when God would meet with the people on Mount Sinai, he would go up the mountain and fire would descend on the mountain. And the people of God learned to kind of take a few steps back. Because God told them, if you go too close, my fire will consume you. And that's a really important and powerful truth. Because not long after God gives them the law, he also tells them to build a tabernacle, a mobile church, if you will. He wants them to build a tabernacle in the middle of the 12 tribes, about 1.5 million Jewish people. And in this tabernacle, God's presence will descend. And here's why that's important. God's presence is among the people. God desires not to be removed from the people up on a hill. God desires to be among the people and with the people. And we need to hear that for ourselves today. That God's desire is not to be removed from us, separate from us, but rather that he desires to be among us and in us. You know, the gospel message is that truth lived out today. That God created humanity, we sinned, we broke that relationship, we severed our connection to God. We became sinful and we passed off being sinful and generation after generation after generation, here we are, and we're born, and we inherit sin, and then we sin on top of it. We even choose to sin knowing better. In fact, if you're a guest here today, let me just say this. At Generations Church, especially those who are followers of Jesus here in this church, we know how sinful we are. Like We're not confused on the fact that we have it all together, because we don't. We know that we're sinful. We know that we're in need of a Savior. And the gospel truth that is portrayed there is that none of us are righteous, none of us are good, none of us are holy. All of us are sinful and separate from God, and there's nothing in our own flesh that we can do about that. And so God himself, high and above, removed from humanity, descended in flesh, the very thing we just celebrated at Christmas, that the eternal God who, who co-created the world with God the Father. God the Son became flesh. And that he became flesh to live like us so that he could become a sacrifice for us and reconnect us with God. That there was nothing we could do to fix the sin issue. So instead, God came to us. 
It's just like that moment where God was removed from the people on Sinai. And to be in his presence was to be consumed and die. But he says, my desire is that I would be among the people. And so he gave Moses the the, the tabernacle and the sacrificial system, the sacrifices that you know about in the Old Testament, they all pointed forward to Jesus. And so it's this moment in that context that the Ten Commandments are given to them, and that's what Moses is setting up for them today. Verse 6, he says, I am the Lord your God. He is now quoting from Exodus. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Who brought you out of slavery? I am God who brought you out of slavery. See, not only did Jesus come and live in human flesh, he lived a sinless life, the life you and I are called to live, but we fail. In fact, we fail even knowing the cost. In fact, we don't just fail, that sounds like a mistake, we choose to sin, even knowing better. I'm not condoning that, I'm saying it's true. But Jesus gave himself on the cross, he died for our sins, he resurrected from the grave to give us new life. He is seated in heaven today and has created a way to be in relationship with him. And how we do that is we repent and we return to him. We hear and understand and receive the good news about what he has done for us. We turn and run towards him. See, we don't half-heartedly follow him. We turn and run. See, our lives should be given over to following Jesus. There's not following Jesus and other stuff. There's following Jesus. And then all the things that God calls us to do in life fit in under that. Love your wife. Disciple your children. Go to work so your family can eat. Go to church. Everything falls under that. But see, it fits under that as a way of worshiping God. You should go to work in a way that glorifies God. You should love your wife or your husband in a way that is glorifying to God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He's reminding us, listen, I brought you out of who you were, the sin of who you were, the, the bondage you lived in. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, I know it sounds pretty simple, but let's press in a bit. Now, if you went to church on Sunday mornings, let's say you came back on Sunday nights when we pray together, you came back on Wednesdays, we're going to be developing a family night on Wednesdays, something for everybody here on Wednesday nights. Let's say you did that, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Okay, sounds good. But on Fridays, you went and prayed with Muslims and prayed to Allah. Would God be okay with that? It doesn't seem right, right? Now, it seems like we're prioritizing God, so no other gods before me. Sounds like, okay, we're, like, we're putting you on top, but we're adding. Well, let me put it to you this way. If you're married, you have a spouse, and you also have a boyfriend or a girlfriend on the side. Now, if you spend a lot of time with your family at home, but Friday's over here, is that okay? We're pretty clear, right? What if you're like, well, I spend Fridays there, but it doesn't always go all the way. No. What if it's, well, we're texting, it's pretty explicit, but I don't ever meet up. You're like, still no, it's getting worse. Keep asking questions, you can be on the couch in someone else's house. What if you're just downloading images and videos of people you've never seen before? You're like, no, still cheating. You'll have no other gods, just as you will have no other spouse. You will have no other gods. Verse 8, you shall not make for yourself the carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, I'm going to reread this verse, but I want to give you something first. So we'll put a note on the screen. Get, idolatry is defined as giving our heart, time, energy, or affection to something created, meaning not our creator, in a way that should only be given to God. Are you called to give time to your wife or your husband and your kids? Of course you are, right? But this is giving time, energy, or affection 
to something in a way that should only be given to God. Remember our marriage example. There are things you should only do with your spouse. And there's a whole host of them. They're not all just physical. There's a, there's a host of things that should only be between you and your spouse. There are those things that should only be between you and God. And when other things crowd that out, here's the reality. There's the creator and there's created stuff. And when you give worship, time, energy, and affection should be given to God, to other stuff, you're trading in the worship of a creator. Oh my gosh, dude, really? I was going to bet that was going to happen, and I did it anyways. I am not to be trusted with things today, am I? <laughs> Jenna will tell you part of this. By the way, Jenna's been a godsend. She works in the neck-fixing industry. And she's been a godsend in reading some of these things. And uh, I'll just say thank you. And I'll just say this. Part of it is a loss of dexterity, and I was a knucklehead to begin with, so you can only imagine what we're going through. So, all right. So that's idolatry. It comes from this verse here, Romans 1. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their flesh to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies. Now see, that's a family of families. You see how that all worked? That was awesome. Thank you, Joe. Yay. Okay. Romans 1, from the top. Ready? Therefore, God gave them up in their lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, not specific to Rome. But listen to this, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Idolatry is defined as trading in worship of the creator for worship of anything created. So if you worship your football team, that's an idol. So if you're watching the game right now, that's idolatry. If you're checking the score right now, when you should be devoted to God, that's idolatry. And no, just because your team played yesterday, you're not off the hook for today. Casey Staggs and the Chiefs. Okay, so, <laughs> by the way, so I was at Bethany Baptist last week, and, and, and the church is highly Asian, or lots of different ethnicities of Asian, and my sarcasm doesn't translate really well, just for the record. Okay. <laughs> and I think that's my spiritual gift, so it did, yeah, Okay. Verse 8, I want to read it again like I said. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." Remember, we already agreed on what cheating looks like. There's something that should be given to God that is given anywhere else, right? So how many of us choose, our, and, I, and I'm, I hope to offend kind of everybody equally, so it, not so targeted as you might think. How many of us choose our church attendance based on what we do with other things throughout the week? Sports out late Saturday night, things you got to do on Sunday because you've been busy and chose other things throughout the week, right? How many of us let that crowd church out? I make this comment every year, Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl's at what, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, right? It's in the afternoon. Nobody should miss church because of the Super Bowl. Super Bowl Sunday is one of the lowest attended Sundays in church. The game's at 3, people, Right? Cowboys might be in it. I'll still be here. I know they're probably not going to be, but still, work with me. It's my day, all right? <laughs> I'm just saying, Cowboys Bills. I know, somewhere Casey just screamed, but we can't choose other things. And if the Super Bowl was playing at 10 a.m., you bet I'd be here. And we should all be here. This is the Lord's day. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's get to the next one. So, what should you put in front of gathering with God's people or in front of spending time alone? Well, I can't pray every morning. I go to work early. Really? What should you put in front of spending time with God corporately on Sundays or alone seven days a week? What is it that should crowd that out? And yet, and I'm saying this, telling you, I know 
Things crowd that out all the time. You have to fight for that space to be alone with God, to spend time with God, to go to church, to be a part of the community. You don't just attend church. You are the church. It takes more than a Sunday morning to be church. And I know that the rest of the world is fighting to crowd this out. But God's command since the beginning of creation has been this. That the corporate gathering of God's people takes priority. And the daily spending time alone and with your family takes priority. And you have to fight for that space. Verse 11. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Pretty simple. Don't use God's name in a, co- name in a common way. It doesn't mean don't cuss. I'm not suggesting cussing is okay. It does not mean that. It means using God's name in a way that is not for worship. Let me give you the most common one I see all the time. You know when you're texting and you see an OMG? It stands for, oh my God. Did you just use God's name in a common way? It's that. Yes, of course, if you're saying God because you're angry at somebody and using it as an expletive, of course. But we should rethink how we identify Jesus or the Spirit or God the Father, how we use that. He says, you shall not use my name in vain, in a common way. That's what he's talking about. Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Now, I know some of you sitting here are thinking, well, that's Old Testament. We don't have to do Sabbath, right? Is murder okay? Because we're about to read that. Is that Old Testament? Is idolatry Old Testament? No. In fact, Sabbath isn't a part of the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant God made on Sinai. Sabbath is one of the first things God created before sin even entered into human history. I want you to hear it with that in mind. I'm going to skip the Genesis verse and just put up Sabbath, please, Marcia. Sabbath was created for humanity before sin as a rhythm for worship. The resurrection and Pentecost both fell on Sunday, so the New Testament church observed Sabbath on Sundays and did not ignore it. The shift from Saturday to Sunday happened when the resurrection took place on Sunday, and then 50 days later, Pentecost took place on Sunday, and the church moved from Saturday to Sunday. Instead of finishing their week, they began their week. Sabbath is an end and a beginning anyways. But Sabbath is all about Worship, corporate worship, the Lord's Day. The church has called Sunday the Lord's Day for the last 2,000 years. It doesn't mean a day off from work. It means a day of worship, a day that is given to God. Look at what it says. Let's start back in verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Labor is your job, all your work is the brakes that you have to fix on your car and the oil change and the whatever else you got to do. Verse 14, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. So work six days and take a day of worship. See, why Sabbath is important is it's different than the expectation that you will put God first in every day of your life. A Sabbath is about taking a day and gathering corporately. That's why he says, observe the Sabbath. And then he's going to tell us how. In fact, the next verse is going to tell us a little bit more. But I want you to hear this. The teaching on the Sabbath is clear. And it is so struggled in church today. I battle to carve out that space. If you're a workaholic, you know, you're probably my people. I get it. Here's what it is. If you work seven days a week, I'll just tell you, and I'm saying this as a point of confession. You don't trust God to accomplish the job in six. I don't trust God to accomplish the job in six. I may give the day. I may be here, but I know what it means to not trust God to do it all in the time allotted. You with me? Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. 
How far off are we, the American church, from this? Miles. I can't fix them. You can't fix them. All we can do is change us. Sabbath for me, and I am speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. Sabbath for me is the same thing as tithing. Tithing is this, that you make an income, that you get a check or you get paid or you get whatever you get, probably not a check, probably auto deposit. I get it. You know what I mean. Tithing is taking the first tenth and giving it to God for ministry to the local church to do local ministry, right? And ministry far away, but you get what I'm saying. Sabbath is the same thing. It's trusting God that I can give him today and that my week will take care of itself. It is trusting God that I can give a tenth of what he has given me here and that I can trust him for the other 90%, which I should probably save 10% and live on 80, right? But I'm trusting him. When we don't trust God, you see it in our giving and in our Sabbath. Verse 15, you shall remember. Now, this is talking about what you do on the Sabbath. You shall remember that you're a slave in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You know, we sing that song with mighty hand and an outstretched arm, right? Therefore, the Lord, Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. You shall remember. This is the contemplating and reflecting on what God's done and what God says. It's teaching us. That on the Sabbath, what we do, on our Sunday, on the Lord's Day, when we gather, what we do is we remember what God has done. Not just to them, but throughout history, we have a lot more scripture after this book. And what God has done in our lives. How God has transformed us. We reflect and we allow God to strengthen us for the week ahead. That is what he gives us for the Lord's Day. Remember, you gather, you hear, you hear God's word, you pray corporately, you sing corporately, all in fulfillment of God's commands of what we do. And you can't replace what we do together alone. You can't go be the church somewhere else. Church is the original word in Greek. Church means, the ecclesia means gathering. The church gathers. It's what we do. And we become a people, a family of families that doesn't leave when we leave here just after noon. It means we stay that. And yes, we prioritize individual worship every day and family worship every day. But corporate bodily gathering of the church is what is intended for the Lord's Day, for the Sabbath. Old Testament Sabbath, New Testament Lord's Day. I'll put this verse on the screen, Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. As we gather, you should celebrate what God has done in you. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I want you to hear what we all understand as the gospel. That the transformation that happens in our lives is because of what Christ has done in us. If you're here with someone and you look at them and you see something different about them, it's the gospel. That's what we reflect on. And when we see that and when that wakes us up, we respond by turning towards God. We respond in repentance. We respond by turning from our sin and running, running towards Jesus. Verse 16, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and it may go well with you in the land that your Lord, the Lord your God is giving you. I know parents love that one for their kids. Sometimes they forget to read it for themselves. We'll leave that alone. All right. You shall not murder. That's just Old Testament. Don't worry about that. I'm kidding. Totally kidding. Don't tweet that out. All right. You shall not commit adultery. We spent time on that one. Adultery goes a lot further than one act. It is an intention of a heart and your mind even before it becomes a part of your body. You shall not steal. Basically, you're not entitled to things you didn't work and pay for. That's good. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Quit lying and gossiping. That's what he's saying, right? And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet or you shall not desire your neighbor's house. His field, his male servant or his female servant, his ox, his donkey. That one's better in the King James English, just for the record. 
or anything that is your neighbor's. The Ten Commandments form a summary. They're a basic summary of all God's laws for us. They're a quick snapshot that remind us the first four about how we love God. The last six are about how we love one another. They remind us of how we are called to behave as God's people. Are any of those things a surprising one in the top 10 list? Sometimes I wonder, like, coveting, like, where was he going? And then throughout my life, I've learned this. When I'm not satisfied with what God has given me, and I covet other things, again, it's a lack of trusting God for what he's given me. There are great, there are great 10 things that are, that are, I mean, obviously, they're from God, so they're amazing. They really do They really do shine light on sinful parts of our lives. I'm going to have you skip down to Deuteronomy 6, and we'll pick up in Deuteronomy 6, 3. Moses is still speaking to the people of God, and we'll pick up in verse 3. He says, hear therefore, O Israel. Israel, remember, Israel means governed by God. So if you are governed by God today, if you live in Christ, if Christ is your Savior, your Lord, and the thing you wake up for, then you're governed by God. He says, be careful to do them that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey, that you, might, that you may multiply greatly. This is a spiritual blessing about being greatly blessed by God. And, and be fruitful and multiply. The very command given in creation is about raising children who worship God. It's about reproducing the gospel into others. It is absolutely a part of sharing the gospel with neighbors and friends, but it is most importantly raising a family that follows Jesus. Multiply, be blessed, he says. And again, I would just say, how would you assess how well that is going today in America? And I would tell you this, the thing that I've learned throughout COVID over the last, what is it, two and a half years now, a little over now, The thing that I've seen is that the church in America is sick, that the church is broken and in need, and that it needs to hear the words of God spoken clearly again and again, that it needs to be called back to the gospel, that it is quite possible that the church in America needs to get saved, that we need life. So here's a couple things why I think God says, why the church in America? And it's not written to them. I get it, us. Here's two things that point to us, that show us why things are not as they should be. You ready? Verse four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's speaking to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Lord our God, the Trinity is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Church in America sadly does not love God, does not love Jesus with all our heart, soul, and strength. We love God with what's convenient. What can I do that doesn't detract from something else? I'll slowly make changes. But again, I want to go back to that marriage metaphor. How quick do we need to abandon things that are taking away from what we should be giving to God? See, our weeks, we tend to start our weeks with our work calendar. Well, I work Monday through Friday, nine to five, whatever it is, right? That's clearly not my schedule, but here's what I do. And then I've got this, and I've got this event with my buddies over here, this group that I'm a part of, this team that I play on, or whatever. And that's going to be here and here. Oh, we've been invited to that small group. I can't make it this week, but maybe next week. We could fit in church here and here, but not here, here, and here. See, we are not loving God with all our heart, with all our soul. By the way, soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, right? That's what a psychologist does. deals with your, psycho- your, your suke, your mind, your will, your emotions. Heart is that metaphor. Strength is the energy you put into it. Do you put energy into something else more than you put energy into following, learning, praying, seeking God? 
And I think we all struggle with that. And I think the American church deeply struggles with that. See, God already answered how we do this. No idols, nothing comes before God, right? Sabbath, take a full day to worship God together with your local church and individually spend that time every day prioritizing God because there is no God but God. And so the creator of the universe has invited you into a daily time of prayer and scripture so that he can reveal himself to you and you could share your thoughts and your needs and your questions with him. And you can critique how I push on Sundays in church and how we are a priority in life. But I would ask you this. So say you're not making Sundays or this church or whatever your priority. And if you're a visitor here who attends another church, what I'm talking about is your church. Well, if you think I'm kind of overemphasizing that because it's about church, let me say this. How is your daily time in scripture and prayer? And if you get that all dialed in, My guess is you will see the value in corporate gathering. But right now, as it is, we fit it in when nothing else will take its place. Well, it's cool because my game's on at 125. I can go to church today. You with me? God has given us how we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. I'll put this on the screen. Holy, loving God. Sabbath is about gathering corporately as a church to worship. Loving God with all our heart, soul, might is what we are called to seven days a week. Our lives are to be focused on God fully, not when convenient. I would challenge you. What are the things you give more of yourself to than God? It could be good things. It could be your kids. I'm trying to prioritize family right now. It could be good things, right? Trying to get our kid into college. It could be good things. It could be outside organizations. It could be recovery programs. It could be any, it could be good things. But when you make a good thing a God thing, it's an idol. And we repent of idolatry. The best place for your recovery, here. Best place for your family, here. Best place for you is here. And prioritizing God seven days a week. Wait, there's one more piece, and this is, this is for us critical, and I'll finish with this piece. It's verse 7. You shall teach them. Remember, we're talking about all that God has commanded. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall take all of this. And I know you're like, wait, take all the things I'm not doing very well? Yes, because none of us are doing them right. None of us are doing them perfectly. All of us struggle and strive to meet God's perfect calling. The bar is high, but grace is this soft landing when we miss the mark. But he says, take that. Take what I've commanded you and teach them diligently to your children. Diligently is to do something with care and conscientiousness in your activity. Do something with discipline and care and passion. The way you approach your hobby, your thing, the thing you go to for fun, that, that's, that's diligently. You are to love God and teach your children diligently about their faith. It means doing something you really care about, passing on your faith. Here's what he says right here. Moses says, when should you teach your children about Jesus? Here, here's what he says. When you sit in your house at dinner, or in place of TV, right, or something. When should you do it? When, you're in a, when you sit in your house, he says. When you walk, or maybe today it's drive, or ride bikes, or an electric bicycle, or scooter, whatever it might be, right? When you walk, when you're traveling from here to there, on your way from here to church, on your way from here to school, on your way, whatever. So when you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lie down, he says, before bed at night, are you praying with your children? When you rise, he says, in the morning before you go your separate ways, do you prioritize your faith in the morning before you go each individual place? He says, teach them diligently. When you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise, teach your children these things. I'm going to close with this screen. Teaching our children. Parents are to engage in their children's faith regularly as a priority over everything else. We will partner with our families, meaning all ages will contribute from singles to seniors, 
Sorry, I flipped those. Young and old, we will pour into the next generation. And let me say this. I've said this a few weeks ago. If you're a grandparent, you're a senior, you may get to retire from GE or the bank, but you don't get to retire from the church. You don't get to retire from following Jesus. See, we need the grandparents. We need the people that were walking with Jesus for longer than I have. We need those who have grown up, raised kids, and are now pouring into grandkids. I was talking to one this week and just saying, listen, I love how she is not only a ride for a grandkid or whatever else, but she helps disciple her grandkids. And that I value that. So whether you're young and single, whether you're old or retired, and your grandparents are great-grandparents, this is for you. And of course, if you're a family at home raising children, this clearly speaks to you. But as a church, this is our rally this year. That we will become a family of families who seek to pass the gospel off to the next generation so that they can worship Jesus better than we did. So that the church they attend and go to or start or lead is better than our church. When I pray for you guys and your children, my prayer is always that these kids never know the idiotic things that I did, that they never know a day apart from Jesus, and that they grow up to worship Jesus better, better than you did, better than I did, that they may have that truly blessed life that God promises. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. You have called us to love you with all we have and, and to pass that love and that, that commitment to you off to our children. To pass it off diligently, with energy, with effort, with passion. Jesus, will you help us to do that? Will you help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength? Will you in, in, in just indwell in us your power? Will you give to us the ability to meet you where we need to be? Will you cause us to change? Will you teach us what has to go and what needs to be more, what needs to be less, and what needs to enter into our lives? And will you help us as a church walk with our parents to hand off our faith to their kids. But I pray that you have burdened my heart for that. I want to see that take shape this year. So we pray these things in your name, Jesus, because you're the only one who can accomplish it. So it's in your name. Amen. <laughs>